uh, I would like to welcome all you to the APRU Sustainable Waste Management Global Lecture Series. I am Amasha Vitana, a PhD scholar at uh, Korea University, and I will uh, host this event. Before uh, starting today's event, I would like to provide some recommendations to consider during the event. Uh, this is a webinar mode, uh, so you can listen and uh, see the panelist, and it is possible to interact through the following tools. Uh, we have enabled two chats, so you can ask questions to our speakers or panelists anytime through a Q&A chat and on the general chat. You could leave some comments or share your important information as well. Uh, if you are interested to talk and ask some questions, please raise your hand and I will unmute you so you can interact directly with the panelists. Uh, as it is an international event, we kindly ask all you to use the English name all the time. Besides, if you have any problem or issue during the event, please feel free to send a chat uh, to me and I will try my best to help you. Uh, we hope that you all will enjoy the event and thank you very much. Now, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Kumudini Palansuria to introduce the program and the speakers for today's webinar. Uh, thank you, Amasha. Hello, everyone. I am Kumudini Palansuria from Korea University. Uh, before starting today's webinar, let me introduce our program briefly. Uh, the APRU uh, Sustainable Waste Management program hosted by the Korea University, which offers a timely opportunity for a knowledge exchange among professionals from all over the world to assist the formulation of an efficient sustainable uh, management agenda for biological waste remediation of soil, water, air in the local context, which uh, satisfies the environmental capabilities, uh, financial uh, feasibility and social needs. Professor Yon C. Kok uh, is the director of APRU Sustainable Waste Management Program. The program is co-directed by Professor William Mitch at Stanford University and Professor David Wardle at Nanyang Technological University. APRU has membership of uh, presidents of 55 leading universities around the Pacific Rim. This includes 2 million students and 200,000 academic staff. As you uh, know, APRU Sustainable Waste Management Program have consistently tried to carry out a variety of programs designed to accelerate the academic activities and international cooperation. APRU uh, SWM Global Lecture Series is part of the regular range of events uh, offered by the uh, program, and it is designed to offer the audience an inside view of cu cutting edge research uh, topics. So today we have uh, three speakers, uh, Professor Angie uh, Nihalsu from IMT, IMT uh, Mind, Minds LB in France, Professor Clara Santato uh, from Polytechnic uh, Montreal in Canada, and Professor Amarke Mohanty from University of Gulf in Canada. So I believe the participants will be able to learn and interact with the world-renowned scientists around the uh, world through this uh, lecture series. Uh, thank you very much for joining with us today. Thank you very much, Dr. Palansuria. Now uh, we will uh, move to the first lecture today. So uh, I would like to invite Ms. Pavani Disanayaka from Korea University to introduce today's first speaker. Thank you, Amasha. It's a great honor for me to introduce our first speaker. Uh, who is Professor Angie Nisse from IMT Mind Salby, France. The title of the lecture is How Metal Species Influence the Production of Green Hydrogen from Biomass and Bio Wastes. Before starting the lecture, let me introduce the speaker. Uh, Angie Nisse is a distinguished professor of chemical and environmental engineering at the Rapsod Research Center, CNRS, IMT Mind Salby, France. He also holds other positions such as Fulbright Visiting Professor at Princeton University in USA, Visiting Professor at Sijian University in China, University College Dublin in Ireland, and Mahatma Gandhi University in India. He is the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Waste and Biomass Valorization. 
He's also a member of the advisory board of FACET program of the World Bank and expert for the EU energy and environment uh, framework programs. His main research fields and expertise are energy and value-added materials from biomass and waste, bioresource to biochar, graphitic materials and graphene, hydrogen and syn gas production from bioresources, functionalization of carbon and phosphate-based composites, hybrid materials for energy and depollution, thermochemical processes, behavior of pollutants such as heavy metals and aerosols. He has published about 190 papers in international peer-reviewed journals and five world patents. He has received international and uh, national scientific recognitions and awards such as Fulbright Scholarship for Scientific Excellence for his scientific accomplishment. Uh, Professor Nisar, over to you. Okay, thank you, Vani, for this uh, kind introduction. And let me first share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, Professor. Yes, Professor. Okay, now no, I want to put PPT mode. And so I would like to, first of all, thank Professor Young Chi for this opportunity given to me to speak to you today. And I had to change a little bit the presentation because at the beginning I was like guessing that it's gonna be longer than the 25 minutes a lot to us. But uh, let's say I'll try to extract the most essential fine lines on the, this quest of uh, using bioresources to generate assets and value, and to see how some of the elements could play a significant role on this. But I'm not going to insist too much on metal spaces. This was the initial ideas, but be, because of the time, I will reduce a little bit. So, and let's see the context. What are we talking about? Why are we here today? And why I'm in Seoul this week? And as you all know, we have had um, a wealthy century uh, thanks to the fossil oil and this exploration that has transformed our world in providing lot of potential and opportunity in generating different materials uh, such as plastic. Nowadays it becomes a burden but it has been and it's still a wonderful materials that has allowed a lot of uh, you'd say development and we've made uh, thousands of uh, devices of goods for people well-being. But the drawback of this is the increase in consumption and the development in Western countries and also elsewhere with this um, move to, let's say, well-being and people are consuming, making sometimes some shortcuts between well-being and consumption, which is a strength. But the, the consequences of this is the sharp increase of waste production. And as you can see in the screen, we do have a lot of uh, troubles nowadays with plastics, with uh, metal that we use to make batteries. And we know there's a tense and scarce situation on access to metals, which is the monopole of some of the country. And it poses problems. It poses question on whether we can change our mindset we can modify the way we see the future. And thanks to the UN and the, the COP21 in particular, that held in Paris three years ago, they have uh, like designed a new roadmap with some targets, objective to 
move towards the sustainable development in uh, reducing the warm, uh, global warming with actions summarized in five pillars. And the first one is energy, how we could make a clean energy in providing a space for renewables. And the second one is environmental. And the first is gonna have a direct impact on environmental burdens and environmental emissions. This also could be strengthened by the role of industry, industry 4.0, which means controlling as much as they can the production of waste and the waste that is not productive, which is anticipated, is the best one we can treat, right? If we don't generate, we don't have to deal with treatment. And also industry is playing the game nowadays because now they know that's not, they're not doing this because of philanthropic needs, but they can make money out of uh, environmental, out of greening their business. And green business now shows the potential for development. And one of the pillars that's gonna help this transition is digital. And these uh, numerical tools that we're gonna put everywhere. We've been uh, visiting uh, LG two days ago and this morning, we have seen the progress, the tremendous progress they have made over the 10 last years. And this is gonna help the transition as well. So all these together, if I take the four pillars that I've been explaining, they must end up in improving people's life and having a social impact. Otherwise, there is no sense, there is no reason to put a certain amount of effort if it's not for people at the end of the day. So the social one's gonna be the target. And with those five pillars, and the transition is on the way, some could pretend it's slow, but it's, it's quite good because uh, the, the awareness is keep increasing, mo mostly for your generation. And I will see it as an hope. I'm not saying that in a pessimist way, I'm quite optimist. And then you could see on the right side of my screen, one of uh, the solution among others, of course, and consisting in using non-food, I insist on the non-food, there's no question of using biomass or residues that is in competition with feeding people. But the residues, the biodegradable that we produce could be used to bring like, like a substitute, not all of it. But I don't believe in saying we're gonna stop fossil fuel and use renewable. This is a job, this is a politic, but in reality it's gonna, we need a mix. We need a, to increase the part of renewable, but we will still need a fossil because of uh, our consumption. So we're gonna use the bioresources to try to cope with the five pillar. This is gonna be the rest of my talk and I will extract from this one of the, the main champion of uh, the sustainable transition, which is hydrogen. But I just wanted to spend some time here to tell you, and there's a, there's a criticism on fossil, but we should remain realistic. We cannot do without it. Uh, the, the thing is that there's a large space for renewable. That's the, the challenge. So to get the assets, if we go from a biomass by waste and residue, I'm going to focus on one stream and one field using thermochemical conversion to generate energy carriers such as hydrogen or synthetic gas and value added materials. With this, we can use different treatments and the combination, the 
could be one, but uh, it's a waste of carbon because it burns all the carbon to generate CO2 and hydrogen, even if we can recover some electricity and heat, but uh, at the end of the day, the carbon is burned and generate as a CO2, which is one of the key burden that we have for the climate change. But we can use a way around, which is biological treatment that is going to generate the biogas or pyrolysis that's going to generate three fractions. It's kind of distillation. We can get the gas, the bio oil, and the biochar. And how to make good use of those uh, final product. And we, we can use various processes such as reforming. And I did add some reaction here for students to see its reaction of methane with CO2 to generate a mixture of CO and hydrogen, which is called syn gas here. And the reforming could be emphasized with the steam and to increase the hydrogen yield. You can see the difference in molecule. And this one is much favorable if the objective is valorization of hydrogen. And what we've done in uh, my case, in my team, we work for production and purification of hydrogen. I haven't done any work on fuel cell yet, but uh, this is something that exists and even at full scale already. And the syngas could go into biomethanation. Here we use uh, bacteria to transform the CO and hydrogen to generate methane. And then we close the loop and we're gonna get methane instead of carbon oxide and hydrogen. And there's also the global concept of uh, transforming bio oil into commodities and using catalyst and we can get uh, alcohol and the olefins. And what I would like to tell you, this has been in place for 100 years. These technologies are mature because these are the ones that are used in the petrol chemistry industry. But the challenge is to adapt them for bioresources. But there is no in technical innovation, which means not a difficult transition. The equipment are the same, but the challenge is on catalyst, for instance. Because we do face some uh, commitments such as acidic gas that could contain the feedstock that may generate some pollution, corrosion, act catalyst deactivation. And with those burdens, it's kind of diverting the biomass from uh, full scale and economic profitability. These are the main challenges, but uh, there's nothing special. It's um, affordable. So if I summarize on the chemical standpoint, I'm providing details as uh, I was told that we talked talking to students, I just want to specify what does that mean in terms of energy consumption. I take the same graph that I've shown you before, and if I take the reforming, what you could see is, is that the reactions are endothermic, and uh, there's a positive entropy, which means that the reactions require energy to be carried out. This is important to keep in mind, which means the transformation of bioresources to value will come with energy issues and that need to be overcome, which means the balance and the profitability is seen in the light of access to energy also. And the gasification is made with a watershed gas reaction which is exothermic, which generate the energy, which means what people do most of the time, they combine reforming and gasification to supply reforming with energy. The enthalpy that is going to be generated in this reaction will be used. It can compensate some, something like 45% of energy that is needed to make the reaction. 
And the same year for the pyrolysis, that's going to burn the bio oil and those reactions need energy. That's why most of the time and uh, people try to be smart on trying to supply with some uh, steam gasification, which is uh, exothermic to bring some energy. And the result of these are three main products, the syngas, synthetic gas, the biohydrogen, bio because it comes from bioresources. Bio resources mean photosynthetic resources and the biochar. I will uh, focus on nitrogen, and which is an interesting and energy vector. People used to say it's an energy. No, it's not an energy. It's the transformation of hydrogen is an exothermic reaction that generates energy, but hydrogen itself is not energy. It's an energy carrier. Uh, it's important to use the correct words. And it's a decarbonized and renewable energy vector, which is very important. And energy density is three times higher than the gasoline. These are enough arguments, which means with one liter of gasoline, I can use three times less distance, for example, in transportation with the same equivalent amount of hydrogen. And this makes the difference, even if it comes with other issues that I'm going to address in a couple of minutes. And also the CO2 emissions, since uh, the hydrogen conversion doesn't generate the CO2, and it's kind of a zero emission in use. This is very important too. That gives a lot of arguments for people who are advocating the use of hydrogen as main source of energy in years to come. There are still a lot of changes to be overcome, but uh, this is the, the, the idea, this is the reason. So uh, we use uh, most of the time uh, lignocellulosic bioresources, as I said, uh, they're not competing with food. It's mostly composed with polymers such as hemicellulose, cellulose and lignin. Uh, with some uh, metal content, which is inherently containing plants. Those reactions need to be catalyzed. As you have seen, there's a deficit in energy because they are endothermic. They need to consume energy. The way to overcome this barrier is using a catalyst in one side and in another side, as I said, a strategy with a steam, for instance, which the condition brings some energy. And for the catalyst, we need uh, to get the, let's say the advantage of uh, oxidation of coke. Uh, you have seen that there's a carbon everywhere in the reaction. At high temperature, we have a carbon deposit and uh, the catalyst is gonna help to remove that deposit because of uh, the energy, uh, the oxygen transfer that could be made by the support. By the way, I should first say the catalyst is two things. It's a support and active phase. And the support could be oxide, like you can see here, alumina, silica, and calcium hydroxyapatite. Those are oxygen storage capacity atoms and they allow the transfer between uh, the, the oxygen and the carbon. And this uh, is gonna, sorry, since we are here, we have this alert, I don't know why, it's security alert, it comes all the time. And also the support brings the basicity. And the basicity increase the CO2 adsorption that help to remove the coke that is deposed. And the active phase is mostly made of metal, noble metal, and which are interesting because they do have a very good performance in transformation, but they are costly. And those not only cost in terms of uh, the, the money, but it's also cost of because of uh, the, the source, the origin. And most of them come from China and you can guess the tense political situation that drives this world almost every day, which means uh, one country can have a control on what's going on everywhere else, which means there is a quest to find other sources of 
metals and uh, the, le the more abundant are transition metals and alkaline earth. Uh, th that's why there's a strong uh, research movement in developing cutters based on, let's say, non-noble metal and to make it more accessible and also prevent the potential political tension in the world. There's a strong also strategies, a lot of papers at um, research scale and also industry scale are trying to combine instead of having a support and active phase, trying to put those in one phase. And uh, there have been a couple of years ago already the MOFs, Metal Organic Framework. Now people are working on bi and trimetallic catalysts and single atoms and the coal share cutters. This is where industry I can cite some research made by BSF, the leader in the field, the German company, and also a lot of papers are getting published on the coal shell where they can, as you can see here, they put a layer, which is here you can see external is the support and inside they have the active atoms, which means the reaction could propagate more in a most homogeneous way that it does with uh, the system where there's a support and then the metal on the surface. This is where the design of new catalyst is moving. With the catalyst, and you can then get the product. So this was on biochar. I'm not going to insist on biochar to keep my time, but I will move straight to hydrogen. So I've taken example of two feedstock. Uh, the coconut shell and the bamboo. And these are projects we have done with uh, Colombia, uh, the students with, from Colombia and Brazil. And what you could see here is the composition. What is important when you consider biomass as a potential source for uh, energy production, there are two criteria to assess using conventional let's say, analysis equipment such as uh, iron chromatography or let's say also chromatography that measure the carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen and oxygen. It's a uh, chromatographic techniques that allow you to measure the oxygen carbon ratio and the hydrogen carbon ratio. If the objective is making energy, the higher the hydrogen carbon ratio, the better. This is the crit criteria that need to be checked. And also the ash content. The ash content tells you how your sample is loaded in metals. The higher the ash content, the better you're gonna get like the activation as long as you get the right metals. So these are the main criteria. There are many, but it's not necessary. You have just to check those elements, the ratio between them and the ash content. And you could see here, for instance, for the, the difference between the component, you could see for, we have taken also the, the activators, those alkali and alkaline earth, second and first and second column of the periodic table. These are activators while components like silica and phosphorus are inhibitors. And you could see in a bamboo coconut shell, for example, we have a tendency of having activators. Why in a bamboo, there are a lot of uh, deactivators, which means if I have to make hydrogen, for instance, the success would be more with coconut than it with bamboo. And I have to know this from the beginning. And the selection has to be made in regard of the objective. If the objective is making biochar, for instance, then it's gonna be the, the opposite. I'm gonna use bamboo because the ash content should be much higher. This is what people do, the, assess, the preliminary assessment for the selection of the shrimp. <coughs> so, and the literature says also that uh, you can predict the efficiency in selecting the, let's say the, metal ratio, they are classified in the literature in three groups, group one, where the alkali are much higher than the alkaline earth, and group two, the opposite, and group three, where the inhibitors are much higher. And let me show an example of result. If we paralyze 
those components and we see the gas production efficiency and there's a product yield calculation here and we use a mass of product versus it's a kind of efficiency we calculate right and you can um, make energy balance you're using the high heating value and the entropy and to determine the fraction of each component of the pyrolysis what it shows here you can see the graph i'm presenting energy fraction versus the amount of inhibitors which are k by sc p here and what you could see on blue is the production of gas and if we use the coconut shell alone we're gonna get like 70 percent of the gas and if i use the catalyst to activate like alkaline earth and then i reach at almost 85 and i gain 20 percent which is a lot okay and then the here for the bamboo for example and there is a there is no significant change because as i said there is a the amount of silica inhibitor is too much which means the bamboo are stream for the production of hydrogen is not going to be the best one while it is for the coconut shell so in more detail if i look at within the gas the composition you can see that the hydrogen is the most abundant which means there are other permanent gas such as CO, CO2, methane, but uh, the hydrogen is uh, for sure the, the high. What is expected uh, when targeting using the bioresources to get uh, energy is the hydrogen CO ratio. It gives you the potential of application in different fields. For example, between 2.5 and four points, right? which is the case here. We are here in a range where we can use this gas for fuel cells operation. And the lower amount can also be adapted for other processes, as you can see here. But the high hydrogen rate allow you to go into the much, let's say, uh, sophisticated applications such as the the fuel cells. And this is, I've given an example with one stream, but you can see that uh, using the biomass, you have to first check the composition, which tells you for which application it could be adapted. This is very important. So, hydrogen again, why? Look at this picture. And if you make comparison with other energy sources, and the difference comes with the fact that there is no CO2 release, but you could see also the energy value. Hydrogen is under 20. Look at methane. Methane is the, the source that is used everywhere in the world. It's a 50 megajoule per kilo, while hydrogen is almost uh, twice much higher than that. Biodiesel, it's uh, three times less, and it gives you the potential, right? Uh, this image shows you the potential. And also on the development, I've extracted this figure from um, was published um, in um, Chemical Engineering Progress. And it shows you how hydrogen enables the development of uh, multiple sector of application. It shows you that it could be used uh, in nuclear, fossil fuels, in um, hydrogen vehicle, synthetic fuels, and medicine, metal refining, and heating, making ammonia. By the way, the main utilization of hydrogen nowadays is fertilizer. I don't know if you know this, but the, the fertilizer industry consume 50% of the hydrogen that is produced in the market nowadays. But there's a challenge with hydrogen which is a gas. And if I go to my gas station, I can uh, fill my car with a liquid, liquid fuel, which is quite easy. But the issue with hydrogen is the gas phase. And then the main challenges that are concentrating the effort of people is how to store the hydrogen and make it available. And they use uh, high pressure technology. 
which uh, needs a pressure between 150 and 700 bars. And there are also some very low pressure, but they need a very low temperature. And you could see where are the issues. And this is like slowing down the development of hydrogen and a lot of efforts is concentrated here. And if you ask me why hydrogen hasn't developed since, and the main reason is the storage to make it available in a safer way in the virus. And there are also a lot of research on uh, making solid materials, uh, metal hydrate, for example. This is attracting a lot of research nowadays to develop solid materials where they can store by adsorption hydrogen and then release it by desorption just by heating or by a change of temperature and um, pressure. This is where we are. There is no issue on getting high quality hydrogen from bioresources, from renewable. And the issue is on the storage and then utilization. Mm -hmm. I think with this, uh, we'll end up my presentation. I would like to make some advertisement on this uh, book and book we wrote last year, which contains all the details on the characterization of bioresources from very different sources and the techniques to characterize the gas, the liquid, the solids, and both advanced and, uh, let's say, conventional techniques. And uh, this is available online. And if you face like the char characterization, as I know that many of you are working on biochar, you can find your way within this book. And uh, they explain everything. It has been made by a lot of people of the world. It provides some wealth in, uh, for people working in the field. And uh, also some environment the conference West Engineering. And uh, Professor, your boss is gonna be, give a plenary lecture at this conference, it's gonna be next year in uh, Denmark. And uh, we hope to see many papers from uh, University of uh, Korea. And I hope to see some of you uh, next year in June. With this, I'm finishing my presentation. I need just to say, Gamsamida. And thank you to my team. They are, they are the ones doing this, uh, let's say, collection of data every day, and I owe them very much. Thank you. Are you still there? Thank, thank you very much, Professor Nisio, for the interesting and very informative presentation you had. Uh, now uh, we can start question and answer session and I do believe that there are a lot of questions from the participants and the question and answer session will be led by Dr. Kumutuni Palansuriya from Korea University. So uh, if you have any question, uh, you could send your questions via chat function. If not, you may raise your hand so that we will allow you to talk with the speaker directly. Over to you, Dr. Palansuriya. Thank you, Amasha. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Angie, for your interesting, uh, wonderful presentation. Um, there is a one question uh, from Sujun. Uh, let me read it. Uh, considering the transformation cost for different type of waste, which type has the lower cost and wider application range? Okay. The, there is a cost, but... Uh... Yesterday, someone asked me the same question when I made my lecture. You know, the cost is very relative. Mm -hmm. uh, look, uh, nowadays, uh, if you look at uh, the steel industry, they, to make the steel, they have to burn the mixture at more than 1,000 Celsius, which is very high temperature. But at the end of the pipe, they sell the steel which the cover, which cost covers the energy cost that they, they use. It's a matter of uh, price at the end of pipe, okay? If we use a thermal treatment like this one for the production of biochar, biochar is a commodity, which means it's not expensive. You cannot gain money after it, which means the, process will be deficit. 
if the objective is producing hydrogen, which is an high-added value component, then the cost, the, the cost of hydrogen will largely compensate the energy that is consumed. Nowadays in the market, if uh, we see the data from International Energy Agency, and the cost of hydrogen should be around two to three US dollars. Nowadays it's at five, which means the effort is to reduce the cost in improving the storage, as I said, which means these are the short term effort. Within two or three, three to four, four years, we can have affordable hydrogen production technology, which the cost in a market will largely cover the cost of production. Yes, so participants, please, if you have any question, please raise your virtual hand so I can let you in and you can directly talk with the speaker. In the meantime, uh, I can see there is another question. Uh, what are the main challenges with respect to practical application of the process of H2 production from biomass and bio waste in developing countries? Okay, in developing countries, uh, even uh, let's say if you're in a Western country and the first step is the collection, right? And you cannot develop any industrial field if the company do not have the guarantee of having the feedstock available most part of the year. They have to secure the feedstock. Securing the feedstock means having the collection facilities and to bring from household, from companies, to the place where it should be transformed. And this is in place in most of the industrial countries, but it is still in existence in developing countries. So the first solution will be the lack of facility for collection. This comes first. And the second one will be the, let's say the, the greed. We are in the countries like in Europe, US, Canada, or Korea, where we have a available grid, which means energy could, could be produced in some places, it will be conveyed where it is needed. In developing country, this grid for energy transportation badly missed most of the places. So to summarize, I might say there are two main hurdles. The first one is the collection, and the second one is the transportation of this energy to be delivered whenever needed. Okay, uh, there is one more question uh, from Sachini. Sachini, do you want to ask your question directly? Uh, yes, Professor. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. And I would like to know the current technologies involved with the biomass to biofuels conversion, especially for the third generation biofuels. Okay. So the if the starting stream is uh, a solid, and the important aspect that determines the selection of the technology are the moisture content and the particle size. Let's say with this combination, I could select either the free dice bed technologies, which will handle humid samples, high moisture contents, but maybe not the ones with very fine particles, powders. This is the first category is free dice bed. The second category, the most robust, sorry, which are used in industry today is the rotary kiln. And the rotary kiln is quite kind of versatile. They can take almost everything, but the conversion rate is a little bit less because of uh, thermal homogeneity, which isn't good. And the third one, 
which is not very popular, but to, it works at pilot scale, which is put it bed, which means fixed bed. But the, the fixed bed is the one that is used in developing countries, for instance, because it's much cheaper. But uh, the difference with the two previous, the free dice bed and the rotor can are continuous technologies, which means you can run, run them 24 hours a day, while the spotted bed is a batch and you have to make some production and stop it and restart. That it makes a difference in terms of course. These are the three mains, but uh, with uh, the leading with free dice bed and rotor again. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you to you. Thank you very much, Professor. So due to the time limitation, so we will move to the next session. Uh, so I would like to express my sincere gratitude for your wonderful presentation and for your uh, contribution for our lecture series. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for question too. I, I'm gonna mute now and leave uh, the stage to my colleague. Thank you very much, Professor. Now uh, we will move to the second lecture today. The, the, the lecture will be done by Professor Clara Santota and the lecture title is En Route Towards Sustainable Organic Electronics. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Kumudani Palansuria from Korea University to introduce our second speaker. Uh, thank you, Amasha. So uh, it's my great honor uh, to introduce our next speaker, who is Professor Clara Santato from uh, Polytechnic Montreal in uh, Canada. Uh, Clara Santota, uh, Santato is a Canada Research Chair in Sustainable Organic Electronics and is Professor in the Department of Engineering Physics at uh, Polytechnic Montreal. Dr. Uh, Santato has conducted and led research projects in uh, both European and North American institutes. For her research on solar energy conversion and light emitting devices, uh, she has been uh, elevated in uh, 2016 to the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, Engineer Senior Membership. Uh, she demonstrated the first uh, melanin uh, pigment based uh, supercapacitor. For this work, she was awarded the uh, 2018 uh, Material Research Society uh, Communication Lecture Award. Uh, Clara uh, serves as editor of the Journal of Power Sources and member of the advisory board of Journal of uh, Material Chemistry C and Material Advances, as well as Nano Express. Uh, Clara is the PI of a Canada-wide collaborative research and training experience in uh, sustainable electronics and eco-design initiatives funded by NSERC, bringing together some uh, 20 universities and industrial partners in Canada and abroad. Uh, Professor Clara, over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe you can grant me the possibility to share the screen. Yes, please. Okay. Thank you very much. This is very kind. Um, first of all, thank you um, for sure. Thank you for uh, the opportunity you, you're giving me and my research group to uh, communicate, to share I mean, with you uh, the work we are doing at uh, Polytechnique Montreal and of course, I mean, a collaborative work. So I would say that uh, Professor Zhu put set out um, the basis, the general context for the effort anyway we are <clears throat> conducting. So, uh, I go a little bit, um, will go kind of uh, fast, but I, I'm not disturbed by question during the presentation. You will see how to interact with me or at the end of the lecture. So there are, you mentioned the Create Seed Initiative funded by the public agency for uh, research in science and engineering in Canada. I would like to add a fourth with the Green Electronic Network that is more a collaborative uh, initiative with the Canadian uh, industry. And then also the Canada Research 
share in sustainable organic electronics. So I'll go uh, on uh, sharing with you. Uh, and uh, I have to tell you from the very beginning, here we enter a little bit the realm of uh, physical chemistry and physics. But I think I'll be uh, clear enough to give you, to share with you the taste of the research we are conducting and hopefully for the future, a kind of collaborative work we can do with your uh, expertise. Huh? So there are three main uh, driving uh, factors that motivate our um, efforts. Uh, and then slowly, slowly, I hope I will match with a uh, uh, suitable answer uh, this uh, open question. So these three main driving factors. The first one is the, of course, and you are the expert more, much more than myself, the accumulation of electronic waste uh, through uh, the ears. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you want planned uh, obsolescence or the lack of environmentally benign end of life scenarios are generating this uh, accumulation of e-waste. The second one is uh, the fact that we are, uh, I mean, the, 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 the presence of critical uh, elements. So elements uh, in the periodic table, we are running out because of the uh, huge pressure by the electronic sector. The third factor is is, and here you might know a little bit less, so I kind of let's pay a bit of attention, even because it connects with the last uh, concept I would like to share with you today, is the energy uh, that is embodied in uh, electronic devices. So the energy that is in the inner constituents due to the uh, manufacturing actually of the uh, device. Mm -hmm. So we try to uh, uh, foresee end of life scenario that are uh, environmentally benign. So instead of just thinking linearly, we try to uh, raise a certain awareness in this sense. The second one, let's try to uh, avoid if possible, the use of critical uh, chemical elements. The third one is how to control the uh, embodied energy in the uh, device, how to limit. Mm? So there are, as for any, uh, I mean, global challenge, uh, the answer are a number of uh, uh, answers, huh? uh, complementary and uh, also maybe suitable to a certain context more than another context in time, in space. So uh, as a function of what you're looking for, you have to adapt, of course, your uh, response. Our way, the way we are exploring, is the way of uh, uh, sustainable organic electronics. Now, let's explain these words. So, when we use the word organic, for, of course, we are, are uh, meaning carbon-based. So, carbon is the main element. When we uh, use uh, the word electronics, what do we mean in this context? So organic materials are known usually to be insulating, electrically insulating. Here I try to be a bit slow and clear because uh, this is something that we need for the following concept. So usually, yes, organic materials like plastics are known to be electrically insulating, as I was saying. The fact is that since at least 30 years, we know that uh, actually as a function of the molecular structure, organic materials, organic molecular materials can conduct uh, electrons and holes. So you can have, uh, you can demonstrate, you can reveal charge carriers as you can reveal them in semiconductors like silicon or uh, germanium or uh, um, I mean, different combinations we use in what we could call in this context, conventional electronics. Now, is any organic molecule capable to have a non-trivial electrical response? Of course not. What is the key? The key is the presence in the uh, molecular structure of alternate single and double bonds. So the alternation of sigma, if you want, and pi bonds. The presence of the pi bonds and the possibility to have a pi-pi stacking is actually the key to generate what a physicist could call an electronic band and what an non-expert, a smart person would call the possibility to have a non-trivial electrical response. So a current uh, upon application of a certain electrical bias. So what we thought, 
uh, I was working, honestly, I was working for years in the field of organic electronics without thinking about the sustainability uh, or without thinking about the environmental impact. Then I thought something. So years of experience in the fields of uh, electronic materials and devices. I thought something. Hmm. So organic materials, they are based essentially on carbon. That is not the critical element. Organic materials can, uh, well, at least it's, it's sound, scientifically speaking, to think about uh, biodegradation or uh, composting. Mm? This is not uh, um, easily conceivable, for instance, for silicon-based uh, um, electronics. And then I also thought, so environmentally uh, sound uh, end-of-life scenario for the material and for the devices. Then we also thought about something else. So these materials are, can be, um, can be uh, soluble in organic solvents. Of course, not all the organic solvents are innocent. And so chlorobenzene is not the same that the MSO or a mix of alcohol is not the same, of course, as uh, uh, chloroform. But we thought they can be soluble, so they can be solution processed, so we can print them. And the printing approach to the deposition of uh, our films is actually one of the approaches we can take to control the embodied energy I was discussing in the previous slide. Okay, so the fact that we, we, we are not using a critical element, the fact that we can foresee this uh, uh, biodegradation at the end of life of the electronic device, but also the fact that we can print the active component of the device made us thinking, hey, let's follow this route and let's see if something good can come out. I try to share with you so uh, what we um, are collecting as, uh, as result. First of all, I add, if you want, a degree more. And this I never thought. So thanks to you, thanks to this lecture. I think something happened in myself and I had an intuition that now I share with you. Not only you can use, uh, uh, so these uh, organic molecular materials, but you can also, of course, uh, simplify even more uh, the situation saying these organic molecular materials doesn't have to come out, out of a synthetic lab, but it can come out, uh, I mean, we can extract it from nature if you want. So different cases of studies that are now, we are now exploring in the lab, for instance, uh, the members of the tannin families or members of the melanin uh, families. Okay, when we say, and now I will have two, three slides on melanins and then we will go to tannins. Melanin is uh, when you, so uh, professors, you know this, I have to make clear. So we're not talking about melatonin that help us to handle a jet lag. We're not talking about melamin that is absolutely an insulating plastic. Here we're talking about a biopigment. When we say melanin, it doesn't mean too much in the sense that we have a myriad of uh, uh, different uh, uh, constituents of this family. We will focus on the brown black uh, pigment we will not talk about other uh, members of this family, but now I will tell you uh, why specifically and since years, and the study is so complex that most probably at least for the next five years, the group will have for students on this, uh, on this material, why we, look, why we selected melanin. First of all, uh, Abundance, let's be very honest. So uh, melanin is ubiquitous in flora and fauna. And I'll show you that uh, we have excellent results in terms of functional properties, just going to the fish market with some extraction and purification, of course, but at the end of the day, we don't have to uh, go to see Sigma Aldrich or specialty uh, companies. The other things is also the, somehow the um, um, fact that it's, kind of intrinsically biocompatible, this uh, material. And so there are this uh, type of properties, but if we go now a little bit more on the physical chemistry, uh, physics side of the story, uh, let's not be scared, but let's also be a bit, um, let's learn something that is uh, uh, new. So melanin has uh, uh, actually a featureless uh, optical absorption from uh, the uh, near infrared to the ultraviolet portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. So it absorbs light. If you want to talk about the solar light conversion, things are not so trivial, but at least now, so there is this uh, um, absorption. 
Then uh, it, uh, it has redox properties. And so I don't know now, I don't want to go too far. But uh, uh, if you go in this um, intermediate box in the uh, slide, you'll see that you have actually three possible redox states. So you can be, uh, you can have the reduced form, that is the hydrokinon, then the semikinon, the intermediate, then the completely oxidized, the kinon. And this redox activity, because of what I was saying a few minutes ago, anyway, coexists with the conjugation, so with the possibility to have semiconductivity. So it's a kind of, uh, look, it looks like a gold mine anyway for, uh, for, uh, for a physicist or for a physical chemist, because we can really study this material, this complex material from different point of view. Now, uh, through the years, and here we are with seminal papers at the end of the 60s or beginning of the 70s, actually there, were, there have been reports on the amorphous semiconductivity of this biopigment. Well before, if you allow me to uh, say, well before the discovery of conducting polymers that brought to the uh, Nobel Prize in chemistry in 2000 uh, for the studies conducting on iodine-doped polyacetylene. So anyway, we have a material with us that is conjugated. So with potential for electronics, for semiconductivity for electronics, it's redox active. It has a, a, a high extinction coefficient uh, through the uh, electromagnetic uh, spectrum, I mean UV near infrared. So we thought this is an interesting material to study when, uh, when we deal with, uh, I mean, non-critical elements, printable and uh, um, uh, biodegradable. So the first uh, challenge, and here uh, really I have to acknowledge uh, the uh, courage and the persistence of the students has been to uh, demonstrate, to study the electrical response in uh, dry pressed pellets of these biopigments and say, hmm, so in the 60s, early studies uh, uh, demonstrate the conductivity of, uh, of the biopigment, but in wet, uh, pellets, so with the possibility to have wet means that you have water. Water generate, of course, H plus, I mean, protons and then OH minus. So the, the electrical response was really not so trivial in the sense that we never, we, it was not easy to disentangle ionic versus electronic transport. My students repeated the experiments, not only with wet pellets to be, to find a total agreement with the literature, but also in dry press pellets. We found actually, uh, with this uh, reversible uh, threshold switching, the possibility to, uh, to have just the exclusive electronic transport in this material. And this now, uh, I think it's kind of uh, very interesting, and I tell you why. We're used in the words of biology or biomaterials, we're used to ionic transport because these materials are wet. And so you have protons that are very light. And so as early as you apply a potential, they can move. Very different is the story of electronic transport. I think that melanin is the first material that we have, for instance, in our body. Our melanin is not only in our skin or in our uh, eyes, but it also in our ear, in our inner ear, in our heart and lungs, if you want the truth, and for reasons that are under investigation. But anyway, it's ubiquitous even in our body. Uh, so it's not trivial to know that this material as a conjugated structure is redox active and it can be just an exclusive electron, uh, electronic material without thinking about, uh, as I was saying, water. But now you could tell me, yes, Clara, it's kind of interesting. Even if I'm not an expert, I can share this curiosity, but uh, I mean, so what? So what I would say, uh, we have to be humble, as of course, uh, uh, all the time when we deal with somehow ambitious or complex research, but there are also results, I think, that are of kind of some uh, interest already from the practical point of view. So with this uh, uh, eumelanin, actually, we uh, demonstrate kind of state of the art from the uh, performance point of view, supercapacitors. So supercapacitors are electrochemical energy storage devices that with respect to batteries are a uh, feature if you want an high power uh, density. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually they are just carbon based. Uh, I don't enter too much in the working mechanism of carbon based supercap, but I tell you that when 
when you have just, for instance, pyrolyzed carbon, the principle is the electrostatic interaction between the surface of the carbon and the electrolyte where the carbon is immersed. In our case, uh, we deal with supercapacitors was working principle is really the redox activity of the biopigment. So we deposit the biopigment on carbon and we have the capacitive component purely electrostatic due to the presence of the carbon current collector, but we add on the redox activity of the eumelanin. And so we enhance, if you want, the charge storage property of the device. Absolutely um, state of the art in terms of uh, uh, performance, so you mean a number, uh, I mean uh, the uh, charge we can store, uh, the power we can deliver, and also uh, allow me to say the, the stability. So we run more than 20,000 cycles on this uh, super cap to have uh, uh, actually uh, essentially an 100% uh, Coulombic efficiency. Now, I don't go into the detail of the uh, transmission electron microscopy uh, images, but we could go uh, in another uh, moment. And in any case, so this is just the beginning. I hope to keep going with the interaction with you. There is another aspect. Once we uh, have so a potential interest, so criteria are satisfied for us to consider this material. And so the material become our uh, uh, target in terms of investigation. We show that the functional properties are interesting enough to demonstrate proof of principle devices. Now let's complete a little bit this picture in the sense, uh, yeah, Clara, you promised me uh, printability and you promised me an end of life scenario, I mean, environmentally benign. So here uh, I show you just kind of rapidly and I'm sorry, uh, the uh, results of effort in, uh, uh, that we uh, uh, made in collaboration with the Canada National Research Council with microbiologists for the Canada Research Council on the biodegradation in industrial compost conditions following, I mean, the uh, standards, industrial standards in this specific case is the ASTM 5338. And so we uh, follow, if you want, the uh, evolution, the mineralization of the uh, melanin, comparing, I mean, with a negative reference that is polyethylene and the positive reference that is cellulose. And actually, we observe that even if uh, for, for the ASTM, for the standards I was mentioning, we cannot consider melanin as, uh, uh, I mean, a compostable material, still we are behaving much better than the polyethylene, uh, not so well as the cellulose, but much better than the polyethylene. And we think that this behavior, this interesting, somehow promising behavior is due to the hygroscopicity of the uh, material that facilitate, I mean, the life of the enzyme to, ac to access the materials itself. Uh, of course, we try to, uh, we should try to uh, improve this uh, performance, and I'll tell you what we are going to do, uh, I mean, to, uh, to go from this 40% after 90 days in industrial compost to, to uh, I mean, increase the mineralization uh, rate. Uh, I, I tell something because it's, it's anyway very interesting to know that if we compare with uh, uh, organic electronic materials that come out of a synthetic lab, anyway, we behave much, much better. So for instance, this copper of thalocyanin or this conducting polymer PVS, so they do not degrade even if they are organic and actually they have an inhibiting action on the, uh, on the, on the process, at least in the case of the copper of thalocyanin. Mm -hmm. So here I have to uh, tell you that uh, we're really looking for colleagues in the microbiology uh, fields because I think we really have to have a library of material that we study to extract after the, I mean, the guidelines to know which kind of organic uh, electronic molecules, which class of organic electronic molecules is actually promising for this uh, uh, compostability route. Huh? For the moment, there are a lot of studies on insulating uh, organic materials, but really essentially nothing on, uh, uh, on, uh, on the conjugated one, on the conductive one. So here the game, I think it's absolutely um, open. I was telling you that um, 
actually we we're hoping to have a little bit higher mineralization rate and we think that if we didn't observe this uh, uh, rate is because of the very complex structure of the material i mean this hierarchical structure so you can see here that for instance we have the building blocks and then they form uh, i don't know the tremors for the state of the art in the literature is that i mean we have the tremors of the building blocks and then they aggregate to piper stacking and then the stacked structure interact through uh, hydrogen bonding but this means that uh, i mean the structure is kind of compact in the nanoscale and so come uh, somehow difficult to be accessed by the uh, enzyme and so we are running actually studies especially resolved studies of course at the nanoscale to try to promote the de stacking actually of the uh, of the uh, molecules now, uh, I know it's pretty short as a lecture, but I hope, uh, I mean, there is some interest anyway. I would like to address the last point, that is the printability. So you see here the melanin that actually we buy uh, in uh, the Montreal fish market. Actually, I go on during the weekend, kind of often. We buy this bottle. We uh, purify, we extract and then we purify. This is time consuming, uh, it's true, but not, not, not expensive at all. And, uh, and we deposit after the extraction and the purification on substrates that have been uh, patterned in a, uh, mm, with conventional photolithography. We have a clean room at Polytechnique. So this is conventional photolithography. You can tell me, Clara, this is not so green. I agree with you. We go step by step. This is gold, uh, gold on uh, PET, so on a plastic that is, of course, not known to be the most biodegradable. But I mean, we just have to go uh, step by step. But I show you that we did something good even on paper, actually. OK, anyway, so uh, once uh, we uh, we uh, have our melanin uh, purified. We have to prepare the ink, and this is uh, this uh, we could say this is a disaster, Clara, because now the ink is the melanin, so it's the pigment plus uh, insulating binders like I mean PVB. Uh, but it's needed to make the uh, this is Manuel, and the other one is Anthony. So kind of my um, the, the 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 leading uh, junior researcher in this uh, uh, in this moment uh, in the group anyway to prepare the ink we have to add uh, these binders in a way that uh, i mean the ink can be actually uh, then uh, introduced in the flexography setup that i will show you in a few seconds this could uh, be scaring in the sense that these binder are actually insulating and so we could think hey, we are kind of diluting the conductive particles within a sea of insulating uh, matter so it's not so, uh, I mean, we wouldn't uh, be so um, happy to do this. At the end of the day, truth uh, is that we deposit our layer kind of easily with this insulating after addition of this uh, uh, insulating uh, binder. Uh, we, of course, we observe uh, carefully our uh, film with, uh, uh, I mean, of course, at the nanoscale with scanning electron microscopy. And what we observe is something uh, that is somehow interesting, I think. So you see that you have these little spherical particles about 100 nanometer size, 100 to 100 nanometer size. These are grains of natural sepia melanin. So uh, grains that you find in the ink of the cephalopods essentially when they release both because they are scared so for defense or for camouflage so this is a structure that is absolutely natural uh, and we see that these grains they have the tendon grains i would like just not to mix up and not to have a fight with a crystallographer i think it's better to call them granules actually Anyway, they have they are really in proximity, and this is very good for somebody that is interesting in the transport physics. Why? Because being very close means being in physical contact means that if there is an electron or a hole, I'm not gonna lose them. Okay, so point is that at the end of the day, our layer deposit by flexography over uh, silicon dioxide that is typically, I mean, in, in, in microfab or uh, PET or paper, actually, we have a super, uh, excuse me, super homogeneous layer with a conductive 
activity that is about six order of magnitude higher than when we go with the synthetic building blocks deposited over very uh, tedious, actually, uh, deposition um, approaches. Huh? So it looks like the binder that we need to formulate the ink to print over large area. And again, I remind you, the printing is for me not just to cover large area and even I mean, a fancy screen, but it's also to control this embodied energy. We have a very high, surprisingly high uh, conductivity due in my uh, this is just my point of view. Of course, we need uh, we need to validate with uh, crossing different techniques due to the um, uh, proximity among granules that include pi pi conductive uh, uh, structures. Huh? So, okay, I think I'm done, and uh, I leave you with two uh, three key messages that are uh, from nature. So we can have a biosourced organic materials that feature an alternance of single and double bonds so that they are promising for electronic applications that can also feature, or uh, I mean, this is, I would say, and or uh, redox active sites. In the case of melanin, you have both conjugation, both kinon redox active group that can be used anyway, in electronics and their powering elements, batteries, supercap. These, uh, uh, so these materials work, definitely they work. And the device uh, fabricated based thereon, they, are, they have decent performance and decent stability. So this legend that the pseudo capacitors or anyway, when you have a redox species on carbon, you have the lamination after a few cycles, it's not always true. I mean, in aqueous media, we run, as I was saying, kind of 20,000 cycle, so it's acceptable. Uh, then uh, they are, even if not res uh, respecting all the standards, uh, all the industrial international standards, anyway, they have a compostability that is much better than the compostability of synthetic organic electronic materials. And so we think that biosourced organic electronic materials, they have, first of all, I mean, we are using carbon as the key uh, element. Uh, second of all, they have a decent compostability, of course, to be improved if we are able to extract guidelines to promote their compostability. We are just at the very, very beginning and uh, they can be printed. Huh? So we don't need high temperature, high vacuum to deposit films. When I use the word film, and I apologize, I should have said this before, let's imagine that any electronic device or any uh, component of an electronic device, so any OLEDs, any transistor, uh, the core of a transistor, the core of, of a LED is actually a very thin film, a nanometric film uh, in thickness. Huh? So if you don't process in a thin film form, you, you cannot have essentially your OTFT. Mm -hmm. Okay, now uh, on the uh, in terms of perspective, I think we really have to extend. And here, I would like not to be a, a faculty, but to be the director of a research institute on nature of functional materials. I have to be open, honest with you because we um, we group in itself. We cannot do too much actually. So we need to uh, collect a, a sufficient number of cases to build a, a library of biosource material right? with the caveats, so with the attention devoted to the, uh, if you want to, to the uh, short term, uh, uh, short uh, range order usually found in this uh, material. Huh? That is a, an ardo maybe for technological application, but it's wonderful from the fundamental point of view. And maybe the two things anyway will converge at a certain point. Uh, next step in terms of compostability, I think it's not only to collect the library, to put together a library, but also to compost the integrated circuits. So I was discussing with one of the speakers at the conference in a French uh, speaker, so uh, uh, Professor Gontard, and uh, maybe that the first, uh, I'm changing a little bit my target, and maybe that RFID tags would be uh, the first um, target, I think, in terms of biodegradable device. Uh, 
and uh, and I have good reasons, I think, to for 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 this um, choice. And then on the very long term, a bit more fundamental but needed are uh, scanning time and microscopy studies to promote the, the stacking uh, of the molecular uh, planes, the pipe stacking molecular planes, and also, but here again, I need colleagues engineering the compost for this specific type of molecules in presence, most probably of traces of metals coming from the uh, electrodes. So. Most of the time I heard my colleagues saying, hey, Clara, these metals can have a, an inhibiting action. So I think we have to be ready to, uh, yeah, to work on the compost, on the, on the really engineering the compost at the end of the day. Okay, sorry if the language was somehow uh, new. Uh, I can try to rephrase or I can try to uh, send you a little bit more literature. But I, I think that at the end of the day, the key point is um, uh, to think that so carbon-based materials then conduct uh, can conduct electricity and can also store um, electrochemical energy. So uh, maybe we can bridge the field of biomass and the field of functional properties in terms of electronics to uh, to uh, as one of the possible routes to make a little bit more sustainable the electronics sector. This was the main message. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, Professor Clara. So actually, we are behind the schedule. So yeah. uh, the attendees can send their questions through uh, chat function and Professor Clara can uh, answer the question through chats mm -hmm. because our next speaker is ready. So we have to move to the uh, next speaker. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Now uh, we will move for the last lecture today. Our speaker is Professor Amalke Mohanty and the lecture title is Carbon Biodegradable Plastics Alleviate Single-Use Plastic Shape. New Challenges in the Changing World. I would like to invite, invite Ms. Sachini Senadira from Korea University to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Amasha. It's a great honor for me to introduce our speaker, Professor Amar K. Mohanty from University of Guelph, Canada. Dr. Amar Mohanty is a full professor and OAC Distinguished Research Chair in Sustainable Biomaterials and is the Director of the Bioproducts Discovery and Development Center at the University of Guelph. He is a former professor from Michigan State University and is an international leader in the field of bioplastics, biocomposites, and advanced biorefinery. His research focuses in engineering value-added uses of biomass waste and industrial co-products from agri-food and biofuel industries. Circular economy, environmental sustainability, waste plastic valorization, biodegradable plastics as single-use plastic alternatives, biocarbon-based composites and 3D printing of sustainable materials are other areas of his, his ex expertise. Professor Mohanty is the editor-in-chief of Sustainable Composites, Composites Part C Open Success Access. He has more than 800 publications to his credit, including 415 peer-reviewed journal papers, six edited books, over 400 conference presentations, 25 book chapters, and 67 patents. Professor Mohanty is a fellow of Royal Society of Canada, the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, the Royal Society of Chemistry, and the Society of Plastic Engineers. Professor Mohanty received many awards, including the J.L. White Innovation Award from the International Polymer Processing Society, Synergy Award for Innovation from Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, Andrew Chase Forest Products Division Award from the American Institute of Chemical Engineers and the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Bioenvironmental Polymer Society in USA. Professor Mohanty, over to you. Thank you so much, Sakini, for your uh, excellent uh, introduction. And thank you, everybody. So I would like to share my screen. This is fine. Yeah, no, it's not fine. It's not fine. Yeah. 
Are you able to see my slide? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. And you got the phone for the phone. So, so uh, thank you very much for the invitation to this uh, global lecture series. And today I am going to talk on the subject matter that's called as Can Biodegradable Plastic Alleviate Single Use Plastic Waste? and new challenges in this changing world. So plastic pollution is a daily headline today. And today my talk will focus on each biodegradable plastic can solve this plastic waste problem. So that's the main focus of my talk today. And what are the key points of my presentation today? What I'm going to talk? First, I will talk mostly on plastic waste. It is a global pollution problem. Waste-free world supporting circular economy because that is the key aspect how to get rid of those waste plastics and move to a new waste innovation. And I will focus most on what are biodegradable plastic or bioplastic. This is the leading trend in the packaging, polymer packaging area. I will also explain what is the biodegradability, what is compostability, what is bio-based and disintegration. There are many misunderstanding, miles and confusion around the term biodegradable that I will explain. And with the bioplastic, what we can do and what are the opportunities? The system challenge is required, so we need uh, incremental or trans transformative cha challenge. We must have to go for a disruptive technology to get rid of those huge plastic pollution problem. So in this, I'll be mostly talking today on bio-based, compostable and sustainable packaging. And then I will provide my concluding thoughts. So before going to the real subject, I would like to talk uh, very briefly what we do in our center here. So our center is known as Bioproduct Discovery Development Center. So our research fundamentally based on circular economy driven research. We try to do some innovation in bioproducts for mitigating climate change. So we, we do our research on novel bio-based materials with a low carbon footprint, reduce grand emission that supports the circular economy. There are two basic areas of our research. One is uh, bio-based but not biodegradable. That is not I am going to talk today. Fundamentally, another type of research we do, bio-based and compostable product, especially for packaging type of applications. Whether we do durable bio-based materials or we do bio-based and compostable material, in many cases, we take the help of agro-residues, food waste, as well as co-product and byproducts from biofuel industry and uh, forest industry, and several co-products, byproducts we use in our research. So regarding this uh, most important thing, greenhouse gas emission is quite a pandemic now. It, it has a serious effect and greenhouse gas emission is a true scientific uh, fact. If you look to this uh, view graph, I have shown the picture from NASA, you can see that that the global temperature is increasing. If you look into this uh, new graph, you can see the orange color temperature is warmer over 1951 to 1980. From 51 to 1980, the global warming is going dramatically in a, in a forward directions. So blue is the blue color color, uh, cooler than baseline, but our orange color is going up. That suggests that we are in a serious scenario so far as greenhouse gas emission is concerned. So global emission need to decrease by 50% by 2030. So reaching net zero by 2050 in order to stay within the 1.5 degree C limit. That's the basic slogan so far as this global arming and reduction of this global warming. So with that concept, I will talk now about this uh, plastic. If you look into the plastic, the plastic, rise of plastic is inevitable. 
and we get a lot of uh, news item today every every day there is a news item about the plastic waste but we need plastic without plastic it is very difficult to sustain then what to do the chart shows how how sharply plastic use has uh, has gone up since 1950 leaving more and more of the material in the world's ecosystem each year in uh, in 2015 we produced in the globe around 448 million tons of plastic and plastic production is going to almost double by 2050 so plastic production is not going to decrease at all we we are going to double the plastic production that means 1 trillion metric tons of plastics we are going to produce by 2050 so if you look to the history of plastic shortage of natural materials during the world war 2 led to search for synthetic alternatives and an ex- and exponential surge in plastic production that continues today so plastics are used in various areas it might be building and construction it might be industrial machinery it might be transportation and it might be electrical components textiles and consumer products and packaging if you look into the various areas the life lifetime of those let's say building and construction the lifetime is about 35 years transportation let's say 20 years like that but packaging is just only few seconds to maximum within 6 months and more than 50% of the plastic is go for packaging the largest market of plastic so most of it never get recycled nor incinerate so that is the biggest concern of this plastic pollution how to solve this so then in the plastic area uh, the end of life people talk one is uh, plastic might be recycled or it is incinerated or it go to landfill if you look into the plastic data from 1950 to 2015 all the plastic that go to after use they remains waste and they stay in the world they don't go anywhere so plastic waste generated about 6 6.3 billion metric tons during 50 to 2015 by now another 6 years has been passed now it, it cost more than 8 billion or 8.5 billion of waste plastic now is there in the world but unfortunately only 9% is recycled and 79% landfill and around 12% incinerated so one thing we need to remember there are a lot of plastic that are recyclable but how much really recycled so if you look to this uh, new graph you see recycled plastic there are a lot of recycled plastic but really recycled is really very low i will give you a few examples if you like look into uh, various thermoplastic polypropylene as for example i will give you polypropylene is a very much well known recycled plastic but whatever polypropylene waste we create let's say 7.2 billion kg out of this only 0.6% are recycled that means more than 99% either incinerated or land similarly other plastic but fundamentally this tell whether it's pet is 9 percent recycle high density polyethylene is 10 around 10% recycle and there are certain plastic like polystyrene 0.9% and many other products like electronics and the data is on average so you can well imagine we get a lot of plastic products they are not really recycled so if you look into the resource need and plastic waste so i i would like to tell you currently plastic waste we are creating that's total weight of the plastic waste is 300 million metric ton per year and this plastic waste if you look into the weight of those waste each year we create plastic waste that is equivalent to weight of the entire human population you can well imagine how much waste we are creating can we sustain such west if you look into this whole uh, population increase if you look into 1990 our our resource need 
was 7 billion tons. What do we mean by resource need? Suppose for us, we need food to eat, dress to wear, and uh, house to stay like that. This, the electricity for our energy. So that means in total, we are, you are requiring in 1990, let's say with the population, at that time, we were, our resource need was 7 billion tons per year. As time goes on, our population increases. In 2005, the resource need requires 60 billion tons per year. And 2050, the resource need for the human population is about 140 billion tons per year. But we have a fixed area in the whole world. So where to get the resource? So 9.7 billion human population will require 140 billion tons per waste. So we cannot sustain any waste. We have to take the waste, utilize the waste as our resource and to get new product. I'll give you a few examples. Plastic pollution end up in the world's ocean. So 8, 8 million metric ton of plastic waste enter into the sea and current status the, it is around 10 million metric ton of plastic entering into the ocean. Another example, one dump truck of plastic waste per minute poured into the sea. By 2050, more plastic in the ocean than fish. 10,000 plastic bags and one garbage truck of textiles wasted per second. Not only plastic and textiles, one third of the food waste are also wasted per year that cost about $750 billion. And those add about 8% global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So you can see waste is the biggest issue now. And now plastic is also used hugely. And how to use the plastic in the material area and how to create innovation. That's the main thing. And another critical things you know, microplastics. Oh, and those microplastic, basically less than, if you look in the plastic, they create uh, microplastic as a nanoplastic, that creates a serious uh, environmental effect as well as health effects. And those microplastic, what are the microplastics? Because any, any plastic less than five mm in size, and nanoplastic is one to thousand micron in size. And those, understand the complex composition of plastic products that create the microplastic, weathering over time that create microplastic, weathering over time also create nanoplastic. So widespread pollution and distribution, that cause widespread pollution and understand the sources and sinks of plastic and all the, comp all the compartments and transport processes involved. Quantify, qualify human exposure via air, water and food. So those nanoplastic, or microplastic are entering into the human body. So that is a critical thing. So as for example, I will give you one specific bottle of water. If you look there, 325 microplastic per liter of the water. Even the water we are taking, that also contain microplastic. Microplastic detected in chicken, fish and table salt. So it is serious uh, issue and now, do we, we have to look into how to get rid of those microplastics. Is there any way how to get rid of this pollution problem of the plastic that, that's become a real pandemic in the whole world? And not only that, the microplastics are raining, microscopic fibers fall from the sky in rocky mountains. So those are a few, few examples. 15 to, 50, 15 to 51 trillion microplastic floating on the surface water reservoir, ocean, seas, and river. So truly speaking, microplastic has become a critical environmental issue at this changing world. We, we have to take care of this plastic pollution. So if you look into uh, plastic pollution, and that is, uh, that is uh, being uh, published in, uh, very, uh, in various journals, and I will cite a, a special issue on this plastic pollution in, in, in science. So conclusion from both the studies by two authors and their group. Conclusion from both to the immediate concerted and vigorous actions are needed for reduction in plastic waste generation. 
in the best case scenario, the predicted growth in plastic waste exceeds is forced to mitigate plastic pollution. Every person or, or the scientists in the whole world are trying, even the company are also trying to mitigate plastic pollution. Whatever maximum efforts we might do, it is predicted the plastic waste will exceed. So we have to find quite innovatively and disruptive technology as required to uh, get rid of this plastic pollution to the best of our ability. Huge quantities of plastic will still accumulate in the in environment. Replacement with alternative products or reuse of the plastic products, new delivery model and system change scenario are required to tackle this plastic pollution in the globe. If you see the plastic waste by the industry sector, there are few few facts you can look into that. I already told packaging is uh, around 46% of all the plastic we produce, let's say 440 million metric ton plastic, around 50% go for packaging area. Although some go textile and consumer products, transportation, building construction, electrical, industrial machinery. If you look into only to the Canada, I can say you one third of the household plastic waste is from food packaging. Because why people make packaging of the food? To protect the food, to increase the shelf life of food, it is required to be packaged. And plastic is a predominant uh, material that is used to pack the food. So having said that, one third of household plastic waste is from food packaging. 86% of Canada's plastic waste go to land fill. 1% of Canada's plastic waste is leaked. 4% of Canada's plastic waste is used for energy production. 9% of Canada's plastic waste is recycled. It is not only in Canada, throughout the world you can see similar trend. I have to give few facts. California enacted legislation to ban single-use plastics. European Union enforced the directive of the single-use plastic. South Australia banned single-use plastic. Canada single-use plastic ban has already happened. And India single-use plastic ban phased out by 2020. More than 120 countries in the world had regulated the plastic ban. So you can see the whole world is now active. What action needs to be taken? Because single-use plastic creates a huge waste, and that is called packaging. Is there any way? we can mitigate those. Circular economy versus linear, a new relationship with our goods and materials. So zero waste and circular economy is the uh, move of the today. So if you look into the uh, currently landfills swell with 9 billion tons of plastic, one ton for every person on the earth, one person in the world is creating around one ton of plastic waste. You can, you can well imagine. And plastic waste is in the ocean up to top of mountain average summit. 90% of Canada's plastic waste is not recycled or recovered. Okay, and, uh, and once Canada, let's say in the Canada, we have taken action plan to have zero waste. That does not mean that zero plastic. We cannot make zero plastic, as I already told. Plastic is inevitable. It means, Plastic reduction and improved plastic life cycle management to achieve a more circular plastic economy is the way we have to go. If you look to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation that started in 2010, the aim of accelerating the transition to the circular economy. It is based on three principles, design out waste and pollution, keep production materials in use, regenerate na natural system. So, Use a closed loop industry, the waste to fix stuff that will minimize the waste and that will help in creating new jobs, reduce the greenhouse gas and new economic flooding. The circular economy concept envisions a waste free world, looks to foster environmental, social, and economical value through closed loop versus a foreign linear economy is the way to move forward. <laughs> Circular economy to circular bioeconomy. What, what do you mean by circular bioeconomy? Bioeconomy, we have to make our products from bio biological sources. That means we have to go to reduce carbon economy. That is one of the bioeconomy 
fundamental things. The concept of bioeconomy is referred to as the revolution in getting industrial product of commercial uh, of re, uh, commercial value from renewable resources. And if you look to the bioproducts, the definition of bioproducts, people do research in biochemicals, bioenergy, biomaterial. That's what I will focus on. That's a stick or composites I, I will be talking about, talking about. Complete sustainability can happen only when bioeconomy combines with the circular economy. So sustainable materials is bio source, recycled materials and waste and their various combinations. That is how people are designing or creating disruptive technology in the packaging and other manufacturing area. What are the meaning of sustainable manufacturing? The creation of the manufactured product that use processes that minimize negative environmental impacts, conserve energy, natural resources, and safe for employees, community, and consumers, and are economically sound. So what are the action targets for this plastic pollution? Use 100% reusable plastic, recyclable, or compostable, or combination of those. And that is the target by 2050. That is what your Ellen MacArthur Foundation's slogan. Eliminate the problematic plastic, single use to reusable model, unlike use and throw. You might think of designing the plastic that can be reusable. Innovate to 100% plastic, plastic packaging, which can be recycled, reused, or composted. So you cannot do only one technology. You have to improve the recycling technology for certain applications. You have to reuse certain plastic and some certain case you have to go for composting. Circulate the plastic produce, reuse or recycle and made into new products. Challenges and alternative solutions for three categories of packaging. What are those three categories? Number one, mixed materials packaging. There are a lot of pa packaging we are using to either package food or any other, other products. It's a combination of plastic, paper and metal. So these are quite, quite difficult to recycle. You cannot separate both. So that means that is the category people have to think alternatives. So if multi-layer fillets. If you go to plastic packaging to improve the self life of food, only one plastic cannot provide the self life of the food. People use multi-layer fillets, plastic filling, because one plastic might give you certain oxygen barrier, another plastic might give you water barrier, so that type of things are required to improve the self life. I will discuss more on that. Monomaterial systems that are impractical to recycle. What are those? Disco disposable products such as cutlery, straws, and takeout containers. So this is difficult to recycle. So those three categories of materials in the whole packaging area need to be renovated, or you have to create disruptive technology to get rid of those type of problems in the packaging area. <laughs> So research and development at the Bioproduct Discovery and Development Center. What do we do at the university? Uh, one, of, one area is sustainable packaging. We do a lot of uh, injection molding, thermal farming, multi-layer films for high barrier applications in the food, beverage, and pharmaceutical marketing sector. So green packaging, it might be degradable plastic or it might be reusable recyclable. And environmental awareness need for reduced greenhouse gas emission, demand for sustainable packaging. Sustainable packaging market is going to enter about more than $350 billion market by 2050. So people are, you know, Coca-Cola bottle, they are trying to innovate 100% bio-based PET, like plastic water bottle type of things, low carbon footprint and supply chain strategy. It is not that you create something in the laboratory. Any, any product you create, for real world application or societal use, all the raw materials should have enough, and that should be that's called supply chain strategy should be taken care. Novel bioplastic and edible packaging. These are the various areas that sustainable packaging is moving on. And I will now mostly, as part of my lecture, I'll be talking mostly about bioplastic. You know, what is bioplastic? Fundamentally, bioplastic means any plastic are obtained from renewable resources. So plant, this, this area is growing. So plant has plant has cellulose, starch, hemicellulose, lignin, and oil. So other components, glucose and xylose, furfuryl alcohol, uh, lignophenol, and fatty acid. People are taking the 
use of chemistry and innovating various biochemicals like lactic acid might give you polylactic acid. This is a, this is a well known biodegradable plastic. Ethylene glycol, you know that plastic butter, they are trying to make ethylene glycol from renewable source. That is a component of PET, polyethylene triphthalate. For eth ethanol is, people are making bioethanol either from corn or lignocellulosic. And in the ethanol, uh, that, that's a poly, people are trying to make dehydration of ethanol and creating polyethylene and polypropylene. So other example, PTT, this is a Sorona that's called from DuPont. They are making bio-based PTT by polytriethylene triphthalate, polybutylene triphthalate, succinic acid is a component for polybutylene succinate, and people are trying to make polyamide or nylon. They are bio-based, but they are not biodegradable and bio-based polyurethane. So this bioplastic area is growing across the globe because of the demand. What are bioplastics? So before uh, going into the various examples of the research, bioplastics, what are the basics? We need to remember, bioplastics are not always biodegradable. There are some non-biodegradable bioplastics. Imagine bio-based polyethylene. Polyethylene obtained from uh, bioethanol. And similarly, bio-based polypropylene bio-based PET, plastic butter, although they are trying to make from renewable resources, but they are not biodegradable. So we need to remember uh, biodegradability is not based on the origin of the plastic, but basically depends on the chemical structure. That is non-biodegradable bioplastics. Conventional, this is a conventional plastic, petroleum-based, automatically they are non-biodegradable like polypropylene. But nowadays, people are making polyethylene from biological source, polypropylene from biological source, plastic bottle from biological source. Another area, biodegradable, bio-based, most example, polylactic acid obtained from corn, polybutylene succinate, polyhydroxyalkanoid, and starch plastics. There are, another thing you need to remember, there are certain plastics which are biodegradable, but they are obtained from fossil resources. Some of the examples are polycaprolactone, polybutylene adipe, terephthalate. So just to remember, biodegradability does not depend on the source of origin. Even from a fossil or petroleum source, there are certain bioplastics that are biodegradable. Okay, that we need to remember. If you look to the global plastic market and global bio bioplastic market, you know, bioplastic is about one to around 2% of the total plastic, but they are increasing from day by day. So global bioplastic market going at a CGR level of 12.5%. However, it is only 4.25% whole plastic market by 2020. Bio-based plastic, not necessarily biodegradable or compostable. Biodegradable compostable plastic, not necessarily bio-based. That I already explained. Biodegradable plastic is based on chemical structure, unlike its origin, either from petroleum or bio-based source. So this is what uh, biodegradable plastic market size is increasing. If you look to these static statistics, global market is about two hundred uh, two billion dollar twenty fifteen. It's 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 increasing to three point four billion by now, and uh, its CGR growth rate is around ten point eight percent. Many biodegradable plastic are commercialized. Any biodegradable plastic that commercialized for real world application. They are not a single bioplastic, which is a combination of biodegradable plastic. That's called polymer blends or polymer composites, unlike one bioplastic. Okay. If you look to the PLA, which is a very well-known biodegradable plastic obtained from corn, and 2015 its production was 545 million ton. Now it has increased to 1228 million metric ton. You can see starch blends, the uh, USD million that the United States uh, dollar dollar value they are talking about, and this value is increasing. Polycap polycaprolactam it is a uh, petroleum based biodegradable plastic because of the biodegradable this production is increasing. Regenerated solution polybutylene succinate is also increasing, and another big area is polyhydroxyalkanoid, so bacterial polyester. The this polymer growth is going very hard. And now I focus more on the biodegradable because biodegradable plastic is the future, especially 
where recycling is difficult, when there are multi-layer packaging type of system, but biggest function of the biodegradable plastic is a barrier pack, barrier. We need a barrier property in order to improve the self life of the food. So a lot of research is going on, chain architecture of the polymers, layer by layer assembly, that's called required for the food packaging. And also people do a lot of do in the polymer blending. And, and the multi-layer co-extrusion is a technology basically used in the packaging, chemical vapor deposition to improve the barrier and impermeable fillers. People use nano clay and other type of fillers. I will, I will give you simple examples how we create a innovative uh, biodegradable packaging by utilizing some sustainable fillers to improve the barrier quite drastically. What is the meaning of biodegradable packaging uh, cycle? Let's say you make something from the form, that's PLA, and they make a bioplastics. Then you use that and put in the composting and they biodegrade into carbon dioxide, water and biomass. That's for the uh, biodegradable packaging life cycle. And biodegradable plastic market size from 2015 to 2020. If you look at the various aspects of the plastic packaging, packaging is the highest growth. And also it go for some type of fiber application, agriculture application and injection molding application and others. But what I would like to tell, packaging is the biggest growth area so far as the biodegradable plastic is concerned. So growth in biodegradable plastic markets, what are the key drivers and challenges for this growth of biodegradable plastic? Number one, favorable government and regulatory outlook, plus increasing consumer awareness on eco-friendly sustainable packaging. That's, that's one of the key drivers to bring the biodegradable plastic more to the marketplace. Increasing scope in the end use segment and search for a new raw materials because biodegradable plastic people are trying to use from renewable source, but there is a huge opportunity to create new biodegradable plastic. Performance issues related to the biodegradable plastic, major challenge. As I told, barrier, barrier requirement is very, very important to improve the self life of the food. Major resistance in the biodegradable plastic market today cost competitiveness over conventional plastic. So whatever bio, whatever green might be, people are not going to pay more for that. So we need to innovate in a such a way. Can we make a biodegradable plastic by cost competitive? I will give you a few examples. How we take a costly biodegradable plastic, but we try to integrate some biomass, agro residues or some waste residues into the biodegradable plastic to make the final product cost competitive. So we must remember plastic industry affect through public per perception. So that is a critical problem on plastic pollution. We must have to innovate. So now it is a very important thing I would like to stress here. The term biodegradability often is misused with a lot of misleading claims and misconceptions. So that is a very critical thing now. So biodegradability, anything, if, if I tell something is biodegradable, it does not make any sense. Biodegradability must be told, what is the disposal system you are talking once you talk biodegradability? Is it a composting condition? Or it is an anaerobic digestion? Or it is soil biodegradable? Or marine biodegradable? Anything which is compostable, that may not be marine degradable. That may not be soil degradable. So there are very few polymers are available, which are biodegradable in composting, biodegradable in anaerobic, or biodegradable soil and marine. Very few. As for example, polylactic acid is a very well-known biodegradable plant, but they are composting, they are industrial compostable, but they are not degradable in the soil, they are not degradable in the marine. So you must remember. Disposal environment, time, rate, and extent of biodegradation must be defined clearly. As for example, based on the STM D6400 standard, a, a compostable plastic must degrade 90% and above within six months. 
if it is not, let's say if the plastic takes 10 years, 20 years, 30 years to biodegrade, we cannot tell that it is a biodegradable polymers. So biodegradable polymers must be tagged with what disposal environment you are using. What is the timing? So let's say compostable plastic must degrade 90% or above in 180 days within six months. If, if it is let's say seven months, eight months, or 12 months, we cannot tell it is a compostable plastics. And extent of biodegradation, 90% and above, as for example, your industrial compostable. So this must be clarified. Otherwise, only talking my product is biodegradable it is a misconception and misleading to the public. Biodegradable breaks down completely. It should completely break down in the composting condition as for example, carbon dioxide, water and cell biomass. False claim. People make a lot of claim. Additive can biodegrade polypropylene, polyethylene, polystyrene landfill. That's, that's completely wrong. Partial biodegradable doesn't make any sense. Breaking down is not biodegradable. Sometimes break down the plastics might create nanoplastic or microplastic. It's more dangerous than not to biodegrade. So we must, there are a lot of false claims that some additive we added, we decrease the molecular weight of polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene. So this is, this is a completely false claim. Labeling a product biodegradable for marketing against the law. You cannot tell a product, my product is biodegradable and bring to the market. You have to tell, is it certified? Is it, it has been tested? A third party certification is required. So labeling something biodegradable without defining is, is against the law in certain, let's say, state of California. Again, compostable product is okay as long as composting facility is available. If, some, if composting facility is not available, then compostable products doesn't make any sense. That creates more pollution. So biodegradable, bio-based, compostable, and degradation and disintegration. There are a few signs. Many misunderstanding, mice, and confusion govern the discussion, the signs and misuse. All, for example, people think all biodegradable polymers are bio-based materials. That is not true. As for example, I told you, biodegradable plastic and also made from petroleum source. So all biodegradable polymers are bio-based are not true. All bio-based products are biodegradable, not true. Bio-based product, let's say bio-based polyethylene, bio-based polyethylene trade thread for go for plastic butter. They are bio-based, they are making, but they are not biodegradable. So if you think or people think all bio-based products are biodegradable, that is not true. Product is biodegradable, throw into the environment. Suppose I, I have a biodegradable product, I will throw to the outside or that will not biodegrade. So that is not also really true. Biodegradability is a quick process, not true. Biodegradability depends what the environment you are using and what is the rate and what is the time. So within 100, 80 days, generally compostability or industrial compostable is valid. So you must define the time limit and environment. Cannot you cannot extrapolate the biodegradation behavior. You know, people make design of experiment in engineering or science and the biodegradation, suppose if, if somebody do the biodegradation test in the laboratory, let's say uh, uh, my, my, my product in the experiment, uh, it was degraded 10% in, in seven days. So 100% will be 70 days. You cannot stop the experiment and can't care. So you cannot extrapolate the biodegradation or what. You have to do the experiment till the end of the uh, required time period. 80% of the consumer thinks bio-based or renewable uh, means biodegradable. That's not true. 60% of the consumers believe that biodegradable products disappear just like when they are discarded. That is not true. I explained those. <clears throat> I'll give you uh, an example, biodegradability versus compostability, they are altogether different. I, you, everybody know newspaper is a biodegradable material, but imagine if you put the newspaper in a landfill, it will not degrade. So you can find a newspaper dumped in New York landfill found mostly intact after 50 years. So it all depends on the environment. If I have a newspaper and I put in the land filling is not degrade, it's, it's not true. 
So biodegradability it must be completely degraded into carbon dioxide, water, and biomass without polluting the soil or anything. That's that we need to remember. Biodegradability, you must talk about the end of life solution, circularity model and closed loop. So this is this is few examples of various biodegradable polymer. So I, I showed this graph already. Bio, this is a complete this, uh, cycling in, in, a, in a composting environment. Nowadays, people talk various composting, industrial compostable, home compostable, soil compostable, marine compostable, that various standards. And one polymer, let's say PLA, polylactic acid, is industrial compostable. That means it is degraded 90% and above in composting condition in 180 days. Polybutylene succinate is industrial compostable. PBSA is a home compostable. Home compostable means it is a home composting standard is different. Temperature is little lower. Here we use temperature 58 degrees C or moisture content around 50%, but here we use 25 to 30 degrees C. So it should be degraded uh, within one year time. And soil, soil compostable and marine degradable. If you look into the PBSA, the home compostable polymer, the, the home compostable polybutylene adipator plate is industrial compostable, is the home compostable, is soil biodegradable. Polyhydroxy alkanoid is a very uh, excellent bioplastic, and this is a biodegradable the almost aerobic and anaerobic environment. This can be industrial compostable, this can be home compostable, this is marine and soil degradable. Cellulose acetate, same like it, it, it's, it's compostable in various environments. So natural polymers like starch, biofill, or cellulose, they are, they, are, they are degradable in various environments. So we need to understand what type of biodegradability, depending on the uh, environment or end of life, you can decide which, which plastic is biodegradable in which environment. Industrial composting, people generally compost, uh, we have to use compost at 58 degrees centigrade. Moisture content will be around 50%. Home composting, this is, this is also certified by certain, certain organization like Austria, and the temperature used for home composting is 25 degrees C, 90% and more biodegradation in one year. So here the time limit is one year, and here is six months. But many usual plastic might degrade in 100 years. They are biodegradable. So we cannot tell this is biodegradable polymer. So that is very important things we must remember. So now, uh, so I will, I will talk something about uh, biodegradable plastic blends for applications. So I will, I will talk some of the innovations of science we did. Can we prepare a fully biodegradable polymer blend with super toughness with high SDT? So, you know, polylactic acid is a very well-known biodegradable plastic, but heat deflection temperature is around 50 degrees C. Imagine if you make a coffee cup with polylactic acid, and if you pour the hot coffee, it will deflect. So we cannot use that for various applications. So sometimes this is one of the limitations. So can we make some biodegradable Unlike a single plastic by polymer blades, can you make plastic that are biodegradable for heat deflection temperature will be more than 100 degrees C? How can we improve the compatibility between the biodegradable polymers without compromising the biodegradability? So people make a lot of research to combine various bioplastics, combine bioplastic with some other biomass, and they try to develop a new products new products is not a single bioplastic, a combination of bioplastics or composite materials. Our strategy for high performance, fully biodegradable blends with high melt strength. We, we create an innovation in our lab by creating a very high melt strength, biodegradable polymer by polymer blending technology. And our concept was a nanoscopic structure on the plastic through polymer blend. Here I, I am giving one example. So within the time, I, I am not going to talk a lot of examples. As for example, you know, what is PBAT? Polybutylene adipate terephthalate. PBS is a polybutylene succinate. There are two different biodegradable plastics. And this polybutylene succinate has a good stiffness, but elongation is quite less. 
PDAT is a biodegradable plastic, but its elongation is very high, but stiffness is very low. But in the final product that you want to use for the real world application, you should have a stiffness, softness balance. So what we do here, we use an additive in a very, very minute amount, this is a peroxide additive. By utilizing this peroxide additive, we, we could put a very small amount of a tougher polymer in the, in the PBS matrix. So you can see in the AC, AFM uh, atomic force microscopy, the PBAT, which is a very tough polymer, stay in the nanoscopic state in the whole PBS matrix. That is the beauty of this innovation. So only a small amount of PBAT. If you use a lot of PBAT, yes, you can increase the toughness, but you cannot get enough stiffness. PBS gives enough stiffness. But once the PBAT is distributed in nanoscopic site in your PBS matrix, then you get a stiffness toughness balance. So surprisingly, we got various uh, mechanical property improvement. If you see into without that additive, this is without additive, this is our elongation is very low. But with the additive, you can see how the elongation gone up up to 700%. So that's the beauty of this nanostructure that that nanostructure could happen by a peroxide chemist that we did. So elongation of the plastic increased by 16%. Low PBAT content, only 5%, or like 50% or 60%. It is super tough polymer we could use. Impact strength is quite high. So, fast reaction rate, optimum peroxide concentration, in situ formation of polybutylene succinate and poly adi polybutylene adequate tape cell copolyp. So, with that nanostructure toughened biodegradable material that we invented, we, we mix that with various low, low cost filler. This might be agro residues or some biocarbon or some mineral filler. And that would help us because once you, this biodegradable plastic might be a little higher costly, but once you make high fill of your waste biomass or waste food residues, then the overall final product become cost competitive. That is the idea. So only is bio plus the uh, biodegradable plastic is certainly higher cost because of uh, low production rate now. So once the production goes up and we create billions and billions of this plastic, then the cost might reduce. But the current level, it is a true fact that many bioplastics are costly than traditional plastic. So you have to take the help of circular economy and include some low cost and inexpensive biomass into the plastic to make your final product cost competitive. So we, we, we did a lot of challenges. I already discussed super top high SDT and idea of innovation, compatible blends in situ reaction mechanism, very low percentage of additive. That's the innovation we created. Invention we did, we created nanostructure, high SDT, low amount of top polymer, one step extrusion. Then we create a lot of, uh, by making some filler, we make some thermophone material, we make injection molded material, we make a plastic films by incorporation of biocarbon here. So that biocarbon helps to make some mulch film type of application. Here we develop some packaging films. We develop some compostable straw by utilizing this invention. And we also do some vegetable packaging. It's a recycled PET which is not biodegradable, but we make some biodegradable trays. And we also make biodegradable podium <coughs> by additive manufacturing. And this is some of the biodegradable plate that can go for greenhouse uh, uh, uses. And Environmental Minister of Canada announced single-use plastic ban at the early years 2021. So it is not only in Canada, this is happening everywhere. I give the example here, plastic grocery bag is banned, straw, Stick uh, tire stocks, six pack rings, plastic cutlery, and take out containers. So, those are single use plastic bags. So, in order to satisfy, we created a lot of single use plastics by utilization of bioplastic circular economy, by integration of low cost biomass into our costly bioplastic, 
and we created also extremely high barrier oxygen uh, based material. So we also discovered some oxygen scavenger from biomass waste that I will give example in my next, next uh, example. So what we do, we, we create a lot of biodegradable green composites by making some binary or ternary blend of different biodegradable plastic or quaternary blend. And we use a compatibilizer, that's a biodegradable blend based malic and hydride compatibilizer, and we use natural fiber. And that natural fiber might be bio, uh, it might be agro residues or some perennial grass and all those. And good thing that in this particular example, you see the PBS PBAT blend, I already explained. And into that we add 50%, 50 weight percent of a grass. MISD means miscanthus, this is a perennial grass. We also did with agro residue, wheat straw, and uh, palm stover, but here is the example, one example of biomass. And, uh, and we also use some compatibilizer. Once you use a compatibilizer, you can see how the properties go down. So this is miscanthus fiber, one example, but you can take agro residue, you can take some other biofiller, and we use a compatibilizer by some blend chemistry. And we, we create a polymer blend and compatibilizer and miscanthus and natural fiber. And we create a very high strength composite materials. We did a lot of chemistry or uh, uh, morphological analysis and different things. And here is the innovations we did at the University of Wealth. Compostable coffee pot that was invented in our university by, by in our lab. So you know that single serve coffee is growing up. So everybody wants a single serve coffee. Only in Canada, the sale of single serve coffee was $1 billion, uh, and United States is $5 billion in 2018. So only in North America, we create 12 billion single serve coffee pot in 2018, which go to West. Fundamentally, they all are going to land really. And you can imagine only in that year, you can circle that, circle this all waste in the air for 13 times how much waste it is, because they create 12 billion single serve coffee pot as waste. And coffee is the second most traded commodity globally next to crude oil. A very recent study United, United Kingdom has proved that 39,000 capsules, this is a coffee capsule produced every minute in the world. And that get 29,000 of that end into landfill. So this is waste you can imagine every minute. And we invented what? We use circular economy. Coffee bean, we, we produce uh, <coughs> coffee, it is a coffee bean, any coffee industry, in order to make the coffee package, they have to take a coffee bean, they have to roast it, then the skin of the coffee is waste. The skin of the coffee bean is called coffee shark. So, in the world, we create about 2 billion kg of this coffee sap, which go to basically into land. This is the waste. So we took those coffee sap and incorporated with the biodegradable plastics and created this compostable coffee pot that is today marketed. So we use biodegradable plastic. We might use grass as a filler. We might use coffee sap as a filler in this particular innovation. The industry choose to use coffee shark because the waste of the their coffee industry. So they utilize that and all distiller dried against you can use as a uh, filler. That is a byproduct of uh, corn ethanol industry. This is called distiller dried against solubles. So we develop these innovations by utilizing bioplastic and various biomass. And this specific example, we use the coffee shark here. And that is where the innovation happened. And this this is an example of circular economy because we are using coffee sap as uh, waste from the coffee industry. And again, we are creating this compostable package again using the coffee industry. Earlier, it was made from polypropylene. This is a polypropylene based ring. This is basically PET, polyethylene triphthalate based mess. And here, it is basically biodegradable uh, PLA and other biodegradable type of polymer we use here. And how this innovation happened? This is made in Ontario in Canada, compostable success story. We have produced more than 1.5 billion coffee pot. And uh, this is the commercial name of the coffee pot, Pot Pot 100 by, by Coffee Club, which is a Toronto-based company. This mild 
stone represents a diversion of more than 3,000 tons of plastic single soil coffee pot from landfills in Canada. Well known brand, President Choice, Maxwell House, and so many big industry who take this innovation to their use. How this happened? This is a collaboration between the Bioproduct Discovery Center of the University of Guayaquil, a compounding resin, the extrusion company, this is an injection molding company, and this is the end user of club coffee. So that's how this innovation entered into market. This is basically local for local connection. That's how a bioeconomy could come to the real world application. And here is the newest innovation we did. You know, the previous coffee pot I showed, they don't, do not need any barrier property. This doesn't have a barrier. This is because they are mostly packaged in another barrier packaging. So this we developed that doesn't have any barrier. And, and this innovation or invention was not targeted for high barrier. But in the second innovation we made recently, this required very high barrier. So coffee capsule. So I already give some statistics, how much coffee capsule is the express type of coffee cup. So we developed this by compostable bioplastic and with a hybrid filler, including biocarbon. Biocarbon, one of the filler here, because that acted innovatively as the oxygen barrier in the whole, whole composition. Specific biocarbon, and surprisingly act as an outstanding oxygen barrier filler. We use a hybrid filler. So the hybrid fillers might be a combination of biocarbon, talc is a mineral filler, and starch granules. So we take the help of four, including another is called your graphite. We, we use the hybrid fillers and incorporate it into the biodegradable plastics and develop this type of high barrier. So this is a compostable oxygen barrier that was developed and uh, innovated here at the University of Well. This is an extremely strong self life period because it protects, because any coffee is very oxygen sensitive. So if oxygen enters into your this package and interact with the coffee, that destroys the taste of the coffee. So it needs to be oxygen barrier sensitive. <coughs> Cost competitive, it is cost competitive, but we could incorporate around 40% of inexpensive filler into the biodegradable plastic. And it is a very high barrier. And you do not need an extra processing uh, manufacturing in the, in the industry. It's a drop in solution. And they are compostable because we are developing this from the compostable plastic. So, compostable plastic and the hybrid filler with the biocarbon, talc, and stuff. This is a biofiller. This is a biofiller and this is a mineral filler. So those are the filler we use, more than around 40%. So we use two types of processing, whether it's injection molding or thermoforming. So accordingly, we engineer our total formulation by melt flow uh, control. And this is quite a sustainable fillers, bioplastic blends and compacted blender. That is what the innovation. Here is a extending self life our novel high barrier compostable technology is unpublished data, but it's already filed a patent. One specific commercial biodegradable coffee pot, one year self life, whereas commercial non biodegradable self life is three years. And our technology, where we use hybrid fillers and unique biodegradable plastic blends and compatible layer, that could show us a self life five years. That means it will not be destroyed or no oxygen can pass and you can safely use those type of package for about five years and it's not required that much but three years more than enough that's what the innovation that could happen to be a high barrier uh, package is not only coffee pot it can go for other type of applications uh, in this type of technology you use so at the end i have to look into the another type Many, many of the things I saw that either industrial compostable or home compostable, but there are certain biodegradable plastic. They are home compostable, industrial compostable, as well as marine degradable. We did some research with polyhydroxy alkanoid, polyhydroxy butyrate, valerate biodegradable plastic, use some natural fiber, and those natural fiber basically, this is a PHBV, <coughs> bacterial polyester. And uh, we, we measure some mechanical properties. Then uh, we use 15% of the natural fiber uh, into this <coughs> into this bioplastic, 25% uh, miscanthos, 15% miscanthos. Here, 85% uh, 
uh, and 15% uh, of DDGS, distilled dried grain soluble. So what I want to say here, <coughs> your modulus goes up and strength little decreases, but surprisingly, we use miscanthus fiber as a filler in the bioplastic. We use distilled dried grains as a filler in the bioplastic, but overall idea is here. <coughs> if you use 25% natural fiber into this plastic, the marine biodegradation happen in 412 days. If you are distilled dried grains, marine degradation happen in 295 days. So that means a natural filler, whether miscanthus grass or distilled dried grains of olive oil, enhances the biodegradability of a specific bioplastic on the environmental conditions. So it is again a uh, innovation that your final product can be biodegradable even in the marine environment. So last but least, as I already discussed a lot uh, so far on these plastic innovations. So you must have to innovate. And if you look to the 2018 Economics Nobel Prize, came once you integrate the innovation and climate to have economic growth. That is the reality. Innovation and progress through low carbon energy and carbon tax to the damage to the environment. So any, anything which is environmentally friendly, we should use. If anybody creating some environmental problem, they should be taxed. That's what the big idea of this 2018 Economics Nobel Prize. So with this, here is my outlook and key message. Number one, plastics are inevitable. We will produce about 1 trillion metric tons of plastics by 2050. The plastic production will almost double. We cannot stay without plastic. So plastic is wasted pandemic because of climate change and pollution. It should be taken very seriously. Bioplastic as the futures in substituting single-use plastic where recycling is difficult. Urgent needs, supply chain, that means once you develop certain things in the laboratory, in order to take a laboratory research for commercialization, whether it's a green product, bio product, that is fine, but unless it's cost competitiveness, society cannot use that. So you must have to create disruptive technology. I gave some examples of some composite materials by utilizing low cost biomass in corporation of bioplastic by, uh, by material chemistry and surface process engineering technology. Affordable solution, costly bioplastic, if that is integrate with low cost agro food waste. That's what we did. Some few examples I showed. However, end of life of this must be considered. We think and redesign, include the effects of additives and compatibility. Once you make a composite materials by addition of biomass <laughs> into a bioplastic, we have to use compatibilizer to improve the performance. But be careful what type of additives, what type of compatibilizer you're using. That must not be non-friendly additive and it must not affect your biodegradability once you are designing a biodegradable product. Another key important is knowledge and education in understanding the term biodegradable, compostable, home compostable, soil and marine degradation must need uh, knowledge transfer. That means it must be taught uh, to, or to be in, uh, disseminated to the public, even from the school level. So that knowledge and education is very required to get the importance of the sustainable packaging. Government policy, Tax to polluter. Anybody who create pollution, they should be taxed. So carbon tax is a controversial subject around the world. And many people, oh, we don't need carbon tax. This is this or that. But in my opinion, in opinion of many body, if anything you are polluting and affecting the human health, and if you are creating something which is not affordable, so we, we, we have to look into government policy and carbon tax and leadership and enter, entrepreneurs can lead this type of technology forward. So in, in final conclusion, circular economy, 
Sustainable Global Growth and Development Bureau West, Reduce Greenhouse Gas Emission for a Better Planet, that I explained. Circular Economy in Packaging and Other Goods and Services. An Inevitable Transformation and a Trillion Dollar Business. The packaging and circular economy are very fair and it's a trillion dollar business and that can go to the societal use through disruptive technology and through a closed loop system and which is achievable and profitable. Not that it's non, non achievable, this is achievable, but you have to create innovation, you have to create disruptive technology. So collaboration, leaders from the academic, industry, government, policy and legislation, non-government organization and international organization collaboration critical in order to uh, mitigate this plastic pollution in this changing world. So I must give my uh, acknowledgements to the various funding agencies who support uh, the circular economy bio-based research in my center at the University of Wales. So there are huge support from various people. And last but least, I am really thankful to all my researchers who really worked hard uh, and uh, are quite innovative researchers who made this technology possible. My special thanks to Professor Young Sri Koke for invitation. And I am also thankful to Kumudini and Amasa for their uh, coordination and contact with me in uh, making this lecture possible. Thank you, everybody. If you have any question, I will be happy to answer. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Mohanty. Uh, before moving to the Q&A session, uh, I would like to invite Professor Angie and Professor Clara for giving some concluding remarks. Or so if you want to add your thoughts, uh, please uh, talk to the audience. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Kumuduni, for let's say let's say this moment we we'll share with you, and we would like to thank you for organizing and for the message we have received, and to make this uh, time with you, I hope useful, and I hope we have uh, at least broadened your views on what you have developed, and it's going to open your mind. And if uh, yeah, you have yeah. questions feel free to contact us. And uh, we also know that beyond this, there's a uh, Professor Young Sik Ok, who has uh, been, uh, he, he had a leading role all this week with all this international, let's say, fellow here. And this is ending up with this lecture. Thank you so much once again, and hope uh, that you could uh, make a very good PhDs, most of you, and be brilliant uh, future colleagues. And we hope to cr cross your roads somewhere here in Korea or somewhere in Europe or in, in uh, Canada. Thank you so much. And I leave the stage to Clara. Thank you so much. Take care of yourself. Thank you. Thank you. So I just uh, joined uh, Ansh uh, in thanking you. And I honestly wish that, uh, I mean, maybe we can kind of contaminate uh, each other with different uh, expertise. So uh, do not hesitate to, to contact us. We are kind of uh, very interested to develop internationally the programs that are ongoing. So you would be the very, more, very most welcome. Uh, and I thank you again. See you. Bye. Thank you so much, Professor. <laughs> Uh, uh, now we can move to the Q&A session uh, with uh, Professor Mohan Amanti. Uh, so audience, uh, if you have any questions, please send through the chat function. Uh, if not, you can raise your virtual hand and then you can talk, uh, directly talk with our speaker. So... While they are thinking, uh, there is a question in the chat function. I will read it for Professor Mohanty. Mm. Thanks, Professor Amar. Uh, I would like to know the possibility of utilizing uh, bioplastic, especially in developing countries where the issues of plastic pollution is high, looking at the cost implications of bioplastic production. 
Also, does the fact they are bio-based implies they are 90% safe for the environment? Yeah, so if I understand the question, the cost is the critical thing in various countries, but as I already told, the cost of the bioplastic is basically depend on the amount of production. Currently, bioplastic production is much lower than some uh, high volume petroleum plastic like polypropylene pathogen. So in order this bioplastic to cost competitive and uh, currently the world is moving and biodegradable plastic production is increasing. But having said that, even the bioplastics can be go for societal use provided you, you can incorporate some inexpensive biomass into the plastics and make your final product quite cost competitive. So I gave few examples uh, like that. Okay, uh, and there are some questions from uh, Pavani. Uh, I will ask Pavani to ask the question directly from you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your very interesting and very informative presentation. Uh, actually, I would like to know your perspective with respect to the possible changes in soil microbial community. Uh, due to the disposal of bioplastic because uh, there can be some, like uh, some certain microorganisms could be dominating uh, when the bio waste bioplastics uh, are added to the soil. Yeah, so as I already told, all bioplastics are not biodegradable under soil conditions. <clears throat> As for example, PLA, polylactic acid, which is a corn-based plastic, if you put in uh, uh, soil, it will not biodegrade. Even the newspaper you put in the soil, it will not biodegrade. There are certain bioplastics that are known to be soil biodegradable. So like you are, uh, one of the example is PHDB, polyhydroxybutyrate, covalerate, and some of the bioplastics like polybutylene, adipate, phenyl, those type of plastics are known to be also soil soil biodegradable again soil biodegradability depends on uh, what is the depth of the soil and what is the aer aerobic condition there so soil biodegradation is not uh, very universal for many of the bioplastics that's why the uh, end of life option is very important so that there must be some uh, environment for some bioplastic whether it's a composting whether industrial composting or, uh, or home composting. So those type of end of environment targets should be there in order to dispose of those uh, new biodegradable plastic in the packaging area. Thank you. Uh, there is a question from Amasha. Uh, Amasha, you can directly ask the question. <coughs> Thank you very much, Professor, for the very informative presentation. So uh, I have this uh, concern, like in the uh, industrial point of view, considering the industries, uh, how convenient, how easy to how easy to get supplied the raw materials to have uh, sustainable uh, packaging because most of the industries they need packaging, whatever the industry. So if they are want to move for have kind of biodegradable plastics, how sustainably they can continue their industry in terms of supplying raw materials. Thank you, Professor. That, that, that's an excellent question, Amasa. Yes, supply chain is very important in the commercialization. We might make some things in the laboratory in the small scale, but in order to manufacture industry packaging, they use millions and millions of pounds. So in such case, you must have to uh, retain the supply chain quite intact. And uh, it, 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 you have to choose your raw materials in such a way that you can find out you have enough raw material. Let's say in many of the examples I showed you, <clears throat> we use a polymer blends. So it's not only one bioplastic. So you might get different biopolymers from different sources. And then you can use some biomass 
uh, that are that are hugely available. I give one example of compostable coffee pot, and in that compostable coffee pot, we use more than three different bioplastics, and we use some coffee sharp, which has a huge availability. So let's say coffee sharp, uh, we have let's say two billion kg globally. This is a waste material that's going to landfill. So it is a matter of uh, industry uh, innovativeness, entrepreneurship. They have to uh, make the raw materials ready. Then only they can sustain that business. So <clears throat> this is not only one, one application, depending on that. And uh, people have to retain the supply chain and in order to bring certain things to the market. The good thing that they say growth is going off the more and more biodegradable plastic production is uh, moving on because of the demand, because of the environmental concern, because of the single-use plastic alternatives. So I believe <coughs> with progress, the production will go on. And once the production go, goes up, then the supply chain issues can be mitigated. Yes, yes. thank you very much, Professor, for the, answering my question. Thank you. Thank you. And there is another question from Vivian. Uh, also, Professor Amar, will the use of agro waste uh, be enough to produce bioplastic that can match the need of the uh, rising pollution population? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Agro waste, uh, agro waste is uh, certainly is uh, one of the ways. And again. The agro waste depends on the regional basis. I, I gave you some examples. Coffee is one of the examples. I also gave some examples of agro residues, and this can be this can be developed on a regional basis. Suppose there are in certain countries, uh, we have a lot of agro residues. Like even if you see to the uh, India, as for example, there is a lot of uh, wheat straw and rice straw. So it is a matter of uh, making those raw materials uh, so, uh, supply chain intact, either by some entrepreneurship or ma making some uh, cooperative. That is how people are doing. And it is a regional basis. You cannot uh, transport a low, high volume biomass from India to United States or some biomass from one country to another country. You have to create your regional based economy, I, in my opinion, this type of uh, innovation or commercialization can happen through local to local market where bioeconomy has shown quite good uh, innovation so far as the agro residues are concerned. Okay, thank you very much. And maybe this will be the last question for you. Uh, dear Professor, thanks for your wonderful lecture. Uh, I wonder if the use of biodegradable plastic in agricultural soil is more difficult to recycle than conventional plastics because uh, it degrades slowly and forms many small pieces of plastic. Uh, does that cause more pollution? This is from Su Chung Wang. So the question is that what I understand in the is it a mulch film type of things you are talking, if I am, I, I am correct in understanding? Yes, you are right. Those type of plastics create a lot of microplastic. They break down slowly and they are not really biodegradable. And that enter into our environment and that create a lot of pollution. That's why those in agricultural field, people are using some, some of the biodegradable plastics, mulch film, which is degrading and 100% in that uh, in that application. But having said that, that application is in a very quite niche market. So it is not very widely used. So yes, uh, petroleum-based plastics like polyethylene, they create a lot of microplastic and in the, in the agricultural film applications. So some, some biodegradable plastic has come out as a mulch film, but that application is in a very, very niche scale now. And people are now trying to utilize many uh, biodegradable plastics, which can be degraded uh, in the agricultural field uh, after after uh, after certain times. And they will not make microplastic; they will degrade 100% into carbon dioxide or water 
and uh, without creating any toxic materials in the soil. But that market is quite uh, uh, niche now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, there is one more question. So after this, we can conclude this session. Uh, Amasha, yes, you can go ahead. Okay, so uh, so I have one more question, Professor. Like during the presentation, I saw that uh, uh, to have to produce some biodegradable uh, plastics, uh, still uh, it's used some uh, fossil fuels. Nah. If I'm correct, Professor. So uh, if so, from one side, we are we wanted to get rid from this fossil fuel with with, with respect to this carbon dioxide emission. Mm -hmm. In that case. Uh, if we are still using this fossil fuel to have this biodegradable plastic. So like, how can we say that it, it is good or it is sustainable? Like, I would like to know this uh, small point from Professor. Thank yeah. you. This is another excellent question. Yes, you are right. And as I already told, some biodegradable plastic is made from petroleum resource. One of the example, BSF make a polymer called uh, Ecoflex, that is called polyutylene adequate tape fillet. And uh, what are the advantages of that? Provided you make a biodegradable plastic from petroleum resources and put in the appropriate environment, they will degrade to carbon dioxide, water, and uh, no, no toxic materials to the soil. So you maintain a complete carbon dioxide cycle. Okay? But imagine, if some petroleum plastics, which are not biodegradable, they are landfill or they are incinerated, they create some carbon dioxide, they add the greenhouse gas emission. But any biodegradable plastic made from petroleum resources, if they are composted or biodegrade, they are not adding extra carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. They are almost uh, uh, completely end of life, they are completely 100% degraded. But if you burn the plastic or incinerate the plastic, then that will create more pollution. So advantage of bioplastic, as long as composting facilities is there, they are not, they are making a complete life cycle by, by, by completing 100% degraded in that particular atmosphere. So they are not adding extra carbon, uh, extra greenhouse gas emission. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for the answer. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor Amar Mohonte, for joining with us today and sharing your uh, knowledge with us. So with this, I would like to uh, conclude this session. Uh, I would like to invite Amasha to uh, give the concluding remarks. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. So this is the end of the ninth session of the Global Lecture Series. I would like to uh, extend my sincere gratitude and appreciation to <coughs> Mohanti and Professor uh, Angie and Professor Clara for your valuable contribution and sharing your knowledge uh, with us during your uh, busy uh, time schedules. And also, I wanted to extend my uh, special thank to Professor Yongsik Oak for organizing this uh, event. And thank you very much, Dr. Palansuria, for your time and for your wonderful coordination of the event. And finally, uh, thank you very much, all the panelists and the program leader and all the participants for attending this event and bringing your expertise and having your questions with us uh, in this uh, gathering. And uh, finally, thank you once again and have a great day for you all. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.